for want of a nail, the kingdom was lost. That's how the catechism goes when you boil it down. In the end, you can boil everything down to something similar. Or so Robert Anderson thought much later on. It's either all an accident or all fate. Anderson literally stumbled over her destiny in the small town of Haven, Maine, on June 21, 1988. That stumble was the root of the matter. All the rest was nothing but history. Stephen King's 16th novel, and the last he wrote before going into rehab, and finally getting clean of all the drugs and alcohol that had been haunting his writings for years, The Tominockers, is a mixed bag. Even King himself admits that the 558-page doorstopper could have used some tiger editing and that there are many, many parts that don't really advance the plot. Not only that, the plot itself is a bit of a mess. Originally published in 1987, not much later after Misery, and personally, I think that is one of the reasons that it was not that well received. Misery was one hard act to follow. The Tommy Knockers was originally supposed to be King's 15th publishing novel because Misery was more on the vein of good old Richard Bachman, whom we will talk about soon. Unfortunately, Bachman had by then passed on of cancer of the pseudonym and so Misery had to be published by his light twin, Stephen King. As I pointed out in the Misery video, that one was the book he wrote as he was working to rehab, where he was realizing how much alcohol and drugs affected his writing and how much of his own life had lost control of. The Tommy Knockers, on the other hand, was started before that, and well, I'd call it a cry for help as it has one of the most realistic descriptions of an alcoholic breakout I have ever read, and the main writer spends pretty much 75% of the novel on the verge of killing himself as he has destroyed his life due to addiction. I can't imagine what Tavita thought as she read that first draft. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm Adalisa Sarate, and today we're going to visit the town of Haven. But I beg of you to be careful with the town's people. They're a nice bunch, but they don't like questions or curious strangers or strangers at all. In fact, they have a bit of a hard trigger temperament and uncertain light. They don't look quite right. So let's not make them angry as we talk about the Tommy Knockers. One of Stephen King's biggest influences is H.P. Lovecraft, and thus, it's not a surprise that he'll be inspired by the chilling the color out of space in many occasions. The idea of something coming out of space to irrevocably change a human being appeared in a couple of his short stories, first in Night Shift, which I will figure out how to cover in the future, like I Am the Doorway, and later in Crip Show's The Lonesome Death of Jordi Barrett or wits in some collections. And this particular influence got together with a childhood rhyme he remembered quite well, the Tommy Knockers, and a heavy, heavy dose of King subconscious about his drug and alcohol problem to create what King himself describes as an awful book. Still, even he admits it's not completely awful. He says that if he rewrote it to all of its lengths, Remember I mentioned the Tiger editing? It could be a good book. And personally, I think it's not that awful, as long as you remember the state of mind he was when he wrote it. In that sense, it's the same situation Cujo finds itself in. Cujo is a really mean book, as we talked about in that video, where nothing good can be seen coming out of life in general. In Cujo, the universe is evil because King was in a very mean mood when he wrote it. In Tommy Knockers, we have a word that it's a literal time bomb, ticking away both in the town of Haven and in our main character's head, in the middle of the chaos brought by what can be described as a very bad drug tripping that strips the addict out of all that makes us human. So it's a sad book, and an awful story, because it's possibly the third most bittersweet of King's endings, 
I mean, nothing competes with Pet Cemetery in the holy shit, how depressed you have to be to end a story like this. But, you know, but it's not a bad book. Because when we ignore the chapters that go nowhere, but that do help us to understand the tone a little bit better, it has the seeds of a terrifyingly good story. What is that story? Oh, well, let me tell you about the small town of Haven, Maine, and its most famous inhabitants, Roberta Bobby Anderson. Bobby is a Western writer who has a couple of bestsellers under her belt and lives in a cabin at the border of the town, with a great deal of goods behind it and inside her property, alone except for her loyal, if aching, dog Peter. Her routine is simple, and mostly around writing, until one day she trips in the woods and finds what seems to be like a metal saucer, and decides to start digging it up to find out what it really is. But then, the changes start. And while Bobby can't stop herself from digging, she also can't stop herself from wishing her best friend was there. Side best friend, Jim Gardner, is a poet who is literally at the end of his rope. After his latest and last poetry reading, he drank so much he attacked the host of the party he was at and managed to get himself blacklisted forever. Gard, as Bobby calls him, was ready to kill himself after it, but a sudden flash of certainty that Bobby was in trouble made him change his mind and go to look for her. When he arrives to her cabin, he realizes that, yes, she is in trouble. But he has no idea how to help her get out of it. And while Bobby originally wanted him there, the week she spent alone with the ship has made her a little bit different. A bit more productive. A bit more improved. It is also affecting the town, little by little. Improving all the town's people, young and old. And although Gar doesn't know it yet, the new and improved Bobby wants him to be improved too. One of the things that makes Tommy Knuckles as a story quite uncomfortable is that for the first two thirds of the book, we're following people who are self-destructing, that know they are self-destructing, and yet do nothing to stop their downward spiral or to drag other people down with them. It's frustrating as hell, especially when said characters seem to realize that what they are doing is hurting them and others, what they need to do to help themselves, and yet choose to do the exact opposite due to either fear, conformity, or addiction. By the time we meet the first character who is proactive and actively wants to stop the horror, we may be a bit numb to it, hence why King thinks the book would be better if it was shorter. In fact, if you take away the sci-fi elements, the alien ship and ghost, it's literally reading an alcoholic trying to get a new meth addict to stop talking drugs and dealing them to others. And of course, that is a very uncomfortable story to read. Let's start with guard or alcoholic and the real main character of the story. When we met him, we are told that he has ruined his life due to his alcohol intake, that he has not written anything new worth publishing in years, and that he survived by reading his poems in different clubs and schools by abusing the hotel's room service bill. In other words, he is pathetic. This is not me judging him, by the way, but the actual narrative telling us this. King goes out of his way to explain why God is where he is, why he ruined his life by being unable to stay dry, and how alcohol destroys his impulse control so completely that he lets his mouth run out about his most pressing obsession, to stop nuclear energy from proliferating due to how dangerous it is. The fact that God has a point with his fear, and remember, this book was written a little after Chernobyl happened, before we really knew how close we had been to losing pretty much half of Europe thanks to one tiny structural mistake, doesn't really matter. What matters is that when he's wrong, which is often, he's completely unable to present his point without resorting to violence and name calling. This is why, by the way, I call this a book a cry for help. Previous alcoholics in King's words were never presented in a positive light, but at the same time, we never saw them as bad as God here at least not without some supernatural influence. 
In fact, one of the first things we learn about Gard after knowing he was once a very promising poet is that he's divorced because one time during one of his drunken blackouts, he shoot his wife in the mouth, William S. Burroughs style. Although, thankfully, his wife survived. And I should really make a tally of how many of his early alcoholic writers ended up destroying their marriage due to alcohol or trying to kill their wives during drunken stopper, because man, that seemed pretty common with at least three I recall right now. Talk about your nightmares showing up in your act. More importantly, at least for the first third of the book, alcohol makes Garth a coward, because even when he knows that something is wrong, that something needs to be done before his friend's body dies or worse, because yes, this is the kind of book where worse and death is not just an idiomatic expression, once Bobby starts offering him beers, he becomes an obedient mule to whatever she wants him to do, even if what she wants him to do is create a threat against the world far worse than a nuclear plant. And then there's Bob, who in this tale is all addict, not to meth, and when this was written, Matt still hadn't been hooked, put to a strange spaceship that makes her apparently smarter, but also much, much less than human. We meet her sober, before even seeing the ship, as a warm, charitable woman who lives alone with her alien dog, Peter. I will say, one of the parts I would never cut from this book are those first two chapters, where we can see how human Bobby is before it all goes wrong. She cares for Peter, for her friend Garth, even when she hasn't seen him in a while and he's a bit of an asshole, for the people in town. When she gets her first fix of the ship, touching it not even knowing what it was, she immediately starts noticing it may be dangerous. There are no animals around it, and then she finds a dead wood chip not far from it, and of course Peter is afraid of it. And dogs, especially dogs in horror novels, are very good at detecting evil stuff. But then the changes start happening, and while we don't know what happened exactly because the narrative shifts to guard on the third day after Bobby found the thing, we know it was that pretty, because by the time guard arrives to see her, Bobby has lost 30 pounds, is afraid her teeth will fall out and some are falling, and Peter is nowhere to be seen. More importantly, the warmth that we had seen in her before is completely gone. And all she cares about is her manic project. A bunch of really weird sci-fi gizmo that she has around the house, including a telepathic typewriter and a mini sun to power her water heater, which, okay, yes, sound quite amazing. And of course, the lid of the ship. Her met, so to speak. At the same time we're following Guard and Bobby through their respective downward spirals, we also get to know the town and see the terrible effects that the ship Bobby found is having in the town's people. This part of the novel is more the invasion of the body snatchers than the color from outer space, thanks to the very few characters who are somewhat immune or manage to fight the effects of the ship long enough, and here once again we have a very pointed comment on drug use. No, seriously, the whole alien ship that makes people incredibly active, able to work for hours on end without feeling tired, but also making them not eat, lose their teeth, and become prone to anger, it's the clearest metaphor for cocaine you will find in horror. So we have the people on the town going a little senile, a little distracted. Suddenly, certain things that would be incredibly unimportant become the reason for terrible fights. There are very few town people, literally two, who see this as a bad thing and try to fight it. One of them, thanks to the only weakness the alien ship atmosphere has, the other thanks to sheer willpower, and this is why I have her in the image. To be honest, sometimes I wish that the main character of the book was this person, Ruth McClausland, town sheriff, because her arc is far more satisfactory than Yard's. See, while she is not immune to the ship, as Gard is at the beginning, she realizes pretty soon what is going on and... Unlike the other townspeople who are either too confused by the beginning stage of what's called the becoming, aka turning into alien creatures like the ones who used to pilot the ship buried in Bobby's backyard, or too busy with other things to realize what is going on until it's too late and their brains have been turned around enough to welcome the change, Ruth knows the change is bad, that it's robbing them of what makes them human 
and she never got to see the final change that would absolutely cement this. And while she, like Gard, is at first distracted by believing that perhaps it's going to be temporary, she doesn't sit in her hands for long. From the moment she realizes that she can't leave town anymore, and that her former friends might actually try to kill her if she tries to stop the becoming, to the moment when she enacts her plan to let the world know what's going on, we don't lose more than three days. That's how determined she is to see the town she loves say. And of course, this is what makes the situation with Gard, and of course, this is what makes the situation with Gard quite frustrating. He is the hero of the novel, and yet he doesn't decide to do anything against the Tommy Knockers, despite the growing evidence of how evil they are, until page 408 of a 558 pages book. His first contact with the changed Bobby is in page 95. He thinks she might have died thanks to the ship, and yet he just keeps going on with her mad plans to unearth the ship, accepting the beers and drinks she keeps giving him to keep him malleable, even when he knows that it's doing that she is doing so to keep him malleable. He thinks about it, he says, Oh, Bobby is doing this so I will not fight, and keeps drinking. There are a lot of moments where he swears that this is the last one, that this time he will remain sober and see what's going on, that he will put a stop to what's happening to his friend. But like so many addicts before him, he fails and takes that next sip. And this is why this works so well. Because yes, it's a story where alien spores turn people into evil aliens, and they civil aliens can create teleporters with batteries and radio shack materials. But there is this very realistic view of how addictions can destroy your way of thinking, which is a real horror. Yes, we want to yell at guards to drop the bottle and start acting, to stop being a coward, something that he tells himself so many times one could do a drinking game out of it, and going to the farm shed to confirm his suspicions about what's going on in town to open his eyes and do something, anything to stop the destruction of Haven and his best friend, even when he is seeing her go transparent in front of his eyes. But for him to suddenly go dry and act like that hero would be completely unrealistic, because getting out of addiction is not easy, and doing the right thing, especially when you are scared, is even harder. Which is also why I'm not that sure that a shorter book would work for the story. Yes, it would be less frustrating and perhaps Guard will not be so easy to hate. But then it would not be this raw and violent look on how addiction works and how it usually ends. There are other interesting themes to analyze in the Tommy Knockers, besides the nature of addiction. There is also a long conversation to be had about morality and about what makes us human almost at the end, where Garth confronts a Tommy Knocker previously known as Bobby about how they view individual lives as easily disposable as long as they serve the group. While Garth and most humanity would agree that the greater good is nothing but a slippery slope and that one death is usually one too many. There's also the question of why Bobby and the townspeople accepted becoming so easily, although that one is a little bit connected to the addiction metaphor. I mean, How many addicts do we know that swear that they can quit whenever they want, but that they don't do it because their addiction of choice helps them to be better? This doesn't include medicine for chronic illness, obviously. That is not an addiction, no matter what some people say. All in all, Tommy Knockers is a long book, yes, and at some points it's tiresome and frustrating. However, just as King said, there is a good story in it. And I think that if you have read the other Doomtown book by King, you will also enjoy this one. At the very least, it's a very interesting contrast to how he went on about writing about another Doomtown two books later and now completely clean. But we will get to that book in time. I want to thank my dear patrons, Mitch Hyman, Elaine Ho, Yasik, and Ellie Riley, as well as my first supporter, Tanya Pineda, and Amy Sung, who is the best person in the universe, and without whom these videos will not exist. I also want to remind you that if you want to support these and my other projects and get your name mentioned here, you can do so at patreon.com slash Adalisa, 
Written link on description, as I know my name can be hard to spell. And with just one USD a month, you will always be thanked in my videos, as well as get access to a ton of art before anyone else. Or, if you prefer a one-off offer, at Coffee with just one donation of three US dollars, you will get a mention in the next three videos I make. If you can't support me this way, I also accept likes, subscriptions to the channel, comments so that the algorithm catches engagement, and of course, you sharing the links. I will also welcome all your questions, feedbacks, and suggestions in the comments below. So now, it's time to get some fresh air and forget about the things that knock in the dark. Because next time, well, next time we're going to meet a writer who has just let go of his pseudonym and is ready to shine under his own name. That is, if his dark half doesn't eclipse the light.